Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me uh, to this presentation, and thank you for spending your evenings um, giving me the chance to uh, teach you a little bit about uh, fiduciary duties and board member responsibilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, which will allow me to put my PowerPoint on. Uh, and as Julia said, if you have questions during the presentation that pertain to a particular slide, she may uh, uh, punt the question to me. Otherwise, I think I'll go through the presentation fairly quickly so that you each have the opportunity to ask questions and, uh, and get something out of it rather than just me talking for the entire hour. So if uh, I click this button, you should all see a presentation now. Is that, is that working so far? Yes. Yes, yeah, great. So we're gonna be talking about board member duties and responsibilities. Um, the word that we use here is fiduciary. And you hear a lot about board members have a fiduciary responsibilities. So what does the word fiduciary mean? So it's a derivative of a fancy Roman word, um, but essentially what it means is that you act on behalf of somebody else, not on your own behalf. So you have a duty of care and a standard of care as a fiduciary um, to somebody else. And that standard of care also requires a duty of loyalty. We'll talk a little bit and you'll hear a lot, a lot of times you hear about, well, what, what does it mean? What is the standard of care? The standard of care for associations and board members is, uh, is something that we talk about under the business judgment rule. And the business judgment rule is a derivative of a corporate uh, legal uh, uh, doctrine, which essentially in, in layman's terms is that a court will not second guess a board of directors decision that is made in compliance with the standard. So what is that standard? The standard for associations under the Uniform Condominium or Uniform Plan Community Act is set forth in section 3303 of the Uniform Condominium Act or the sister statute, which is the Uniform Plan Community Act. In that case, it would be section 5303. But essentially, this is it right here. And I don't wanna read the entire thing to you because um, obviously that would take too much time. But again, it uses the word fiduciary relation to the association. And that as a member of the board, you must perform your function in good faith in a manner that you reasonably believe to be in the best interest of the association and with such care, including reasonable inquiry, skill, and diligence, and the proportion of ordinary prudence would use under similar circumstances. So the buzzwords here are fiduciary and good faith in a manner you reasonably believe is in the best interest of the association. Now, this statute specifically also uh, governs um, and incorporates what's called the Prudent Investor Act. And the Prudent Investor Act is a corporate statute, again, that uh, prescribes the particular standard of care with regard to investment of trust funds. And I don't want you to, to know what exactly it means, um, but when you're talking about uh, association investments and reserve investments, I want you to know that there is an applicable standard of care for those investments under the Prudent Investor Act. And this is what it says, fiduciary shall invest property held in trust in the following standard. General rule is not to risk principal to invest in fiduciary uh, in FDIC insured vehicles only. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, I don't need you to know exactly what the Prudent Investor Act means or says, but that it's out there and it is a standard that applies to it. The, main part that we always harp on when we advise associations on their standard of care and what it means to, to perform their due diligence is that associations are uh, not only encouraged, but required to rely on the advice of experts. So in the act, it says in performing the duties as an officer, the board members shall be entitled to rely in good faith on information, opinions, reports, data statements, 
or statements, including financial statements of the following persons. One or more officers or employees of the association whom the officer believes to have reasonable reliance confidence in the matter. So for example, your management uh, company and your managing agent is one of the quote unquote uh, experts that uh, has subject matter expertise on particular matters. So you can rely on those. Of course, maybe not on legal issues. For that, you have counsel, public accountants, or other subject matter experts or professionals or expert competence of such person. So again, in, in performing those functions, if you don't know the answer to a particular question and you wanna meet the standard of care, you rely on the advice of um, third parties. You can also rely on committees. Uh, committees are sometimes helpful when engaging uh, questions that uh, you may not have the answer to because you don't have the feel of the community uh, in, in matters of perhaps, you know, aesthetic control or, you know, what, what do the unit owners want when we, when we uh, renovate the clubhouse? Would they like, you know, an additional card table? Those are the kind of things that you can um, task committees with and on whose advice you can partially rely in making the decisions. So again, Reliance on experts examples, management company, managing agent, your arborist, landscaper, or your roofer, subject matter experts such as lawyers, accountants, insurance prof professionals, and engineers. Um, and um, I think those are the, the categories that we as association boards uh, most often have the need to, uh, to seek advice from. So there are of course uh, exceptions to the reliance on experts uh, sort of safety net. So if you as an officer of the association have matter knowledge on a particular issue, you can't ignore them. So if you're an attorney and you are a board member and you know that the board is breaching fiduciary obligation or doing something that is not in accordance with the documents, um, then you are not acting in good faith, if you believe that based on your own knowledge and your own subject matter expertise, that reliance would be unwarranted. So same goes for an accountant or, or management agent that is on the board. You have to bring your own experience to the table. So you can't stick your head in the sand as a board member. You need to, to bring and use your experience um, both in your professional and personal lives that, that you have. So in addition to the <clears throat> um, standard of care, you have a dual duty of loyalty. So because you're a fiduciary, you obviously must avoid the conflicts of interest, personal pa passions or prejudices. That doesn't mean you can't have personal opinions, um, but to the extent you have a personal interest in something or uh, a, or, or in the outcome of something, uh, that is something you need to put aside as a board member. Of course, I don't need to tell you that, but it's part of that, uh, part of this uh, presentation. Uh, personal gains must of course be uh, avoided. Uh, motivations to help a particular unit owner, you, know, you must avoid the appearance of impropriety at all costs. And sometimes that requires that you disclose relationships or financial gains or pecuniary interest in, in a particular decision. So th those are all you know, fancy words that we've all heard and uh, come to understand uh, in, in some way or degree as most of you have probably served on boards uh, for a long time. But you know, there's some really basic rules about you know, what do we do to meet this fiduciary standard? Um, I think first and foremost, you, you attend all meetings of the board um, and you participate in those. Um, that you not just, you know, warm a seat in the boardroom or in front of your Zoom, um, that you'll be informed about the association's business. And that if you have, uh, and that you participate in the discord and decisions making of the board. If you have a particular uh, interest or, uh, or, or objection to a matter, it's, it's okay to register dissent. 
and to make your opinion known. And sometimes this is uh, uh, something that unit owners need to be reminded on, particular board members, that you, you main, maintain your, your board member uh, emails and board member communications separate from your personal files so that uh, you know spouses and family members that don't have access um, because your, your duty of loyalty also requires a duty to maintain confidentiality. So I would, if you, don't, if you haven't done it, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, um, I would suggest that you not share your board emails or board email address with your spouses or significant others or family members. It's really a, a, a separate and confidential uh, communication. We can have an entirely uh, lengthy seminar on what should be done um, by email or via email or, or voting via email. Um, and we can talk about that separately some other day, but it's important to remember that the, the, uh, the confidentiality and the, uh, the, the duty to maintain uh, the, the loyalty to the association does apply to your emails. Um, so be mindful of that and consider it when you have board discourse or 37 emails about a particular matter or about a particular unit owner um, that probably should not be in a long-winded email discussion that may be discoverable later in court. But in any event, um, uh, I digress on that issue. So meeting the standard also means that when you are familiar with association business, that you have a, a general familiarity with the documents and their hierarchy. So of course you all know you have a declaration. You also know that that declaration is in the hierarchy of your documents. It's the most important document. I don't need you to be familiar with every portion and every section of the declaration, uh, but generally, of course, um, that, that matters are governed by the declaration and that you may need to look into that document uh, for guidance on a particular issue. Of course, you have a, a set of bylaws uh, which govern the you know, administrative and, and procedural aspects of the association. And again, it's not necessarily important that you know what the quorum is for a particular meeting or when a meeting date should be held. Um, but it's important that you know that those kind of issues are most likely governed by the bylaws and you may have to look in there. You know, the final association document um, that you have is the rules and regulations. And again, you're, you're imposing the rules and regulations and compliance with them on the unit owners. Um, I would like you to be familiar with, with most of the provisions in them. Again, not important to be uh, verbatim familiar with every section and every paragraph and every procedure, um, but it's important that you know where to look. Administrative policies of the association, you know, th th those are sometimes uh, also contained in the rules and regulations really depends on whether that these are more internal procedures such as investment policies um, or, or confidentiality or ethics policies. Again, as a board member, you should be familiar with all of the association's documents, including contracts and agreements, management contracts, um, pool maintenance contracts, landscaping contracts. Um, again, know where they are, how to get to them, how you ask for them, um, because these are uh, obligations and agreements that you as a board member enter into on behalf of the association. If you're spending association money through those contracts, you should be generally familiar with them. And of course, we need to keep all these documents in a, uh, in a place. You have professional management in this case, but not every association is uh, professionally managed. All of these documents are business records and must be kept in accordance with procedures in accordance with state law. Again, uh, familiar, you need to be familiar where they are, how to get to them, and how long you need to keep them is, is probably something that you wanna rely on the experts on, uh, whether it be your accountant or your managing agent or your attorney. Associations um, are, are unique in that not only are you required 
as a board member to be familiar with your declaration and your bylaws and your various association documents. Uh, as a, a housing provider under federal law, there are a number of federal and state statutes that apply to association governance. And again, it's not important to know, you know what those laws say and how to apply for them or how they apply, I should say. It's Im important to know that generally these apply. For example, the Fair Housing Act applies. Uh, in some cases, although associations aren't what are called public accommodations, the Americans with the D Disability Act may apply. Um, if you're collecting debt, the, the Fair Collection Practices Act will, will apply. It certainly applies to association uh, attorneys. Uh, you may be tasked with having to deal with uh, a bankrupt unit owner, so the Bankruptcy Act uh, applies. And if you have uh, employees and staff in addition to management, then federal or state employment laws, unemployment laws, workers' compensation laws will also apply. Uh, finally, of course, we have state law here in Pennsylvania, the Uniform Plan Community Act, and the Uniform Condominium Act will apply. And depending on um, how your association is governed and located, you know, municipal or city ordinances and regulations will also impact how your association does business. Um, so it's important to know that you, you may have to ask a question of your experts, your management team, your association attorney, your accountant, um, of all of these issues, Fair Housing Act, Reasonable Accommodations, Americans with the Disability Act, you know, width of doors, entryways, um, you know, are you a public accommodation? Do you open your pool or other accommodations to the public? Do you, uh, uh, you know, provide swim lessons to the public? Something uh, to that effect. These are, these are things that you, you don't have to know the answer to, but you don't know, but you do know, can't speak anymore. But you should know when to ask the question and who to ask the question. Okay. So how do we how do we apply the standard of care? So what's most important is that the action of the board is authorized pursuant to applicable laws and the governing documents. And clearly, you're all familiar with um, your your bylaws and the powers and duties section of the board as to what it authorizes the board to do, um, when it requires a committee uh, to act, when it requires a unit owner vote, or when something, for example, may be simply done by a vote of the, uh, the board members. For example, most documents will say that the board is a, a authorized to adopt rules and regulations and will not require a vote of the unit owners. Therefore, if the board acts to adopt rules and regulation, that question would be authorized. This is this one here is is the one where we fight about a lot, which is must be taken in good faith in a, in a manner reasonably calculated to further the best interest of the association. So sometimes it's difficult to determine, you know, what is the best interest of the association as a whole, and 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 we look at it the other way. So action must be free from fraud, bad faith, or self-dealing, and, and reasonably calculated to address a matter that needs to be addressed. For example, if you have uh, a lot of violations uh, or a lot of dog issues, you want to adopt a rule and regulations about dogs, that certainly would be in the best interest of the association, and you have the power um, to enact such rules. You know, the, the, the fraud, bad faith, and self-dealing are kind of self-evident. Um, but it is a standard that we need to be aware of as well. If you meet that standard, you are granted a limited immunity. So what happens is that executive board and his members shall have no liability for exercising their powers provided that they are authorized and are exercising good faith and in a manner reasonably calculated to be in the best interest of the association. So that provides two kinds of immunity. First, it protects the board members from individual liability. So if the board member 
meets the applicable standard, they cannot be individually held liable for a, a decision that has gone back. Um, and in addition to protecting the board member individually from, from the liability, the action that meets the standard will generally not be overturned by a court of law. So it, it, it's a two-prong immunity. Um, and, and both of those things are important, especially now that when we, we, we talk about, you know, uh, what do we do during COVID-19 and what, what does a board member have to do to protect the interests of the association? And if it doesn't, do board members have individual liability? And, and the answer really comes back to the standard of care. Did you meet the standard of care? Was the action that you took authorized? Was it calculated to be reasonably in the best interest of the association? And if it was a subject matter that is beyond the board, uh, did it consult with experts such as cleaning vendors or management team or their attorneys, um, or for example, the municipality uh, on, on how to meet that standard of care? And if it did, then the board members should not have um, individual liability and the action will be protected and upheld by a court of law. So that, that is important. And that's why we talk about um, the standard, did you meet the standard of care? Uh, did you act? Did you meet your fiduciary obligation? So I've, I've, I've said a lot of things and I've, I've talked about a lot of buzzwords and things like that. And I know you must have a lot of questions, uh, particularly about you know, your, your personal experiences and, and maybe a particular issue. And I know in the last couple of weeks, I've been getting a lot of COVID amenity reopening questions. So rather than continue to talk on, on, on the standard of care, um, I would love to take some questions and, and, and really have you get uh, some practical uh, knowledge and advice and uh, uh, you know, something to take away from, uh, from this presentation. So I, I think this would be a good spot to kind of do that. Thank you. We had a couple questions come in the chat that I'll just go on and, uh, and announce. And then if anybody else wants to ask questions, you can feel free to raise your virtual hand or put them in the chat and I will announce them. So uh, the first question that we got was related to uh, basically professional advisors. So is our snow clearing company considered experts when they ask if we want an ice check. If we say no, does that mean we did not rely on expert opinion and does that make us liable if someone falls because of ice? If the snow company rely, I mean, you're, did you ask? I guess it depends on whether or not you asked for the advice or this advice was given and you have to determine, you know, is this a, uh, uh, is this the snow company um, doing its job? Is this snow company trying to protect itself or is the snow company uh, trying to make money? And I think you need to determine um, where you are in the process. So if there, if there is ice out there and if it continues to snow um, and somebody slips and falls, you will get sued. But the snow company will get sued as well. And the reason they ask for these checks is to protect themselves later because they're going to be defendants in that lawsuit. So what they're, what they're going to send is, I told the board that I should do a snow check or whether or not they wanted a snow check. And they said, no, they didn't authorize to, for me to go out to spend another hundred dollars. And therefore uh, you can't blame the snow removal company for not going and, and salting. So it, it's a little bit of everything. So you need to make sure that uh, when that kind of question is sought, it, it, it's kind of a loaded question, right? So you want me to go out there and kind of check whether there's ice? Well, we know there's ice. Um, what does the contract say? Is this something that they're supposed to be doing anyway? Is this something that's, uh, that's being charged extra? Um, and, you know, is it, is it freezing temperature out or are they just trying to make more money because tomorrow's going to be 50 degrees and right now it's 40 degrees? So, it's a great question and it's going to depend on the circumstances. And, and I think you need to decide, look, it, it's been snowing or raining. Uh, it's right around freezing. And the last time the snow company was here or assaulted anything was, I don't know, 
more than 12 or 24 hours ago, maybe it's not a bad idea to protect both the association and its insurance policy. And of course, the unit owners from a slip and fall, because you don't want anybody getting hurt, apart from the fact that you don't want to get sued if anybody does get hurt. So yes, that evaluation is part of your standard of care. Uh, you want to talk to your, your managing agent. Well, what do they think? Are they doing this for other associations? What's the weather report look like? And do we have any reports of slippery conditions now? I mean, I think most of you will probably be fairly familiar with the areas now that are susceptible to more uh, snow buildup and are familiar with, you know, where should you pay more attention to? So I would, uh, uh, I would certainly not ignore a request specifically or especially a written request by the snow removal contractor uh, pointing out an issue or asking to give authority uh, to, uh, uh, to at least look and investigate. Now, certainly you can say, you know, we only have a couple feet of sidewalks, you know, maybe a board member goes out and say, says it's either completely dry and there's no ice on it or it's already salted. But you need to check up on it. You can't. You can't not check up. Great question. Thank you. Uh, the second question we have is uh, related to COVID and amenities, and I just want to preface this by saying that uh, Camco is hosting another uh, virtual event on March 25th, specifically related to any COVID and uh, reopening plans and liability issues. So, uh, you know, if you do want to attend that too, we will be sending out an invite in the next week. Um, but the question on that is, last year we opted to keep our pool closed in part because we had good reason to believe our insurer might refuse coverage since a COVID infection would, be, would have been an expected loss. This year we know for certain that we would have no coverage as our policy would add a communicable disease exclusion upon renewal. Knowing that we would be fully exposed to such liability, how can a board possibly open a pool while honoring its fiduciary duty give, given the current environment? We really, really want to open our pool, but how do you ask a board member to place themselves at personal risk just to open the pool? Right, so that, that has a couple of questions. So I'm gonna start with the last, the last part of that question, and it says personal risk. So when we talked about the standard of care, if the decision meets the standard of care, good faith, best interest of the association and reliance on experts. And there, there are several experts that probably have input and subject matter knowledge on this. So if, if based on that decision, you in good faith make a risk analysis decision and say, we can, we can open, then board members should not have personal liability. So that doesn't mean that they can't get sued, doesn't mean that the association can't get sued, but um, I think unless there is some kind of bad faith or willful misconduct or gross negligence by the board members, they're not going to have individual liability. Now, this, the, the, the decision to open or not open amenities has been um, basically my 24 seven task since, uh, you know, late March, just about an entire year ago. And when we talked about it in March, it was pretty easy because the government stepped in and says, you got to close everything down. We have the emergency order. Um, we're shutting down gyms. We're shutting down pools. We're shutting down, uh, you know, everything, but these essential services. And then we all came to find out uh, whether or not we were included in those list of essential services. And many of us found out that they were not. Um, and as those government restrictions started to be lifted, boards started to have uh, more discretion in deciding to open uh, their amenities and whether to do it. And you know, what are, what are the decision-making processes and what are some of the things that we need to think about? So when boards, went and relied on the experts, they spoke to a, a bunch of different people. So they spoke to their managers. What are other associations doing and how, how are they dealing with it? They spoke to their pool company. Um, what are other associations doing? How much would it cost for you to do clean? 
are you even going to be providing these services? Are you going to be um, providing lifeguards or pool attendants? What would that cost? You're talking about, we're talking to cleaning vendors. Um, will you come and clean the clubhouse and the bathrooms? What would that cost? Are you willing to take the responsibility for making those areas uh, COVID uh, free? Then they talk to uh, their attorneys. Um, what's the liability of individual board members if they decide to open? What's the liability of the association if it decides to open? It, uh, what is the liability of the association if it decides not to open and a unit owner decides to file a lawsuit because you, they're paying for an amenity that isn't uh, isn't available? And then, of course, as 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 the question said, we had questions about do we have insurance coverage? If we don't have insurance coverage, um, what would a lawsuit cost even if we win it? Um, what would a lawsuit cost if we lose it? Is there insurance that's available for, uh, for COVID-19 related cases? And then associations went on the CDC guidelines and maybe the Department of State guidelines and, and checked with, well, what are the recommendations for pools? What are the re recommendations for, for tennis courts? The USDA put out a slew of recommendations for tennis courts, the same for pickleball courts, the same for bocce courts, the same for swimming pools, whether they're in, indoor and outdoor, and, and the same for, uh, for uh, uh, gyms, association gyms or private gyms. So we had this overload of information. And, and the problem uh, in, in 2020 and March and April was that that information was not consistent. So the CDC changed its consistency almost on a weekly or daily basis. So you read on it on Monday and the pool regulations were the following. Then you read it on, on Wednesday and they reduced some, the social distancing went from six feet to 12 feet and then it went back to three feet. Then it's one mask, now it's three masks. Uh, so these, two, these all of these criteria are changing. Um, but it, again, those are all resources upon which many associations relied uh, last year in deciding, you know, it's just too risky. We're not going to open. And, and the factors are the infection rates are high. There are no cures. There is no vaccine. Um, the, the death rates were high. They were, you know, they were going up and down and spiking all over the place and around the holidays they were spiking. So we didn't really know enough in 2020 to, to make a really educated guess as to what the risk would be. We also didn't know whether or not any of these courts or legal systems would have um, tolerance for 19 cases. It, it's a kind of really novel new thing. Will, will the courts, uh, you know, what would be the standard of, what would be the, the proof, the burden of proof? How do you prove that somebody got it at the clubhouse or at the gym or at the pool, um, you know? If it's an isolated incident, almost impossible to prove. You can get it at the supermarket or on the way to the pool or from, uh, you know, from your relatives. And people at the pool come down with the, with the coronavirus, you know, maybe there's some connection that they got it. But then again, you know, what is the association's responsibility in all of that? And if it is sued, um, what are the courts expecting the association to do in order not to be quote negligent? So, the standard I think that a, a lawsuit would have to meet is that it needed to show that an association acted negligently in opening its facilities. And what does negligent mean? Well, negligence means the failure to act in a reasonably prudent way. So we already talked about that. What does reasonably prudent mean? You have all these different guidelines that you can, you can uh, rely on and there are associations that have opened their facilities that did exactly um, what some of the private entities did. They, they decided, okay, I don't, I know I don't have insurance coverage. So we know that there's a risk of a lawsuit and we know that the lawsuit is probably going to be expensive even if we win. And they said, okay, so let's assume we're gonna have one lawsuit and it'll cost $100,000 to defend. And then they looked at the CDC guidelines and they said, okay, so we can meet all of those CDC guidelines 
for swimming pools. And since that was really the, the, the main standard, how could a board be deemed negligent if it met the main standards? And the main standards were about frequent cleaning and monitoring social distancing and face masks and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of associations that opened had uh, swim by appointment and had pool monitors and spent a lot of money trying to comply with the CDC guidelines. So those associations that did open followed the CDC guidelines. I know here in Bucks County where uh, many of my clients have uh, uh, facilities, the, the Bucks County Department of Health was very proactive and actually created a whole set of standards that associations had to meet uh, for COVID mitigation in order to get an, op an opening permit for the swimming pool. So that was sort of an additional threshold that associations said, well, if I can meet that standard, and if the Department of Health is willing to give me a pool opening permit, uh, if I follow these, these guidelines, how can I be negligent? I know associations that opened their pool, that accepted the liability. Most of those associations were very large associations, like 12, 1500 homes that made a decision that said, we're going to meet the standards that the CDC has set out. We have the money or we're willing to invest the money in hiring uh, cleaning vendors and the pool company to do these additional things. And we're willing to tolerate the risk that we have one or two lawsuits um, that might cost us $100,000 or $200,000 to defend because if we assess that against the unit owners over a couple of years, it's really not that much money and we think that the risk is low. Okay, so that was the analysis. Can I tell you that I think that those boards were negligent? No, I think what the boards needed to do was do the analysis. They had to go through the process of making the uh, the determination as to what is the risk to them, what are the factors, and can that board tolerate that financial risk? Um, and in, in, in those cases where the association spent the money and, um, and opened the facilities, um, I think I have a handful of associations that did that. And knock on wood, we did not get a single lawsuit for opening um, and, and having anybody get COVID. Of course, we, we put in place waivers, we put in place signage, uh, we put in place you know, every safeguard that we can think of to meet you know, all the various standards that were out there uh, and then some. So we did extra things. We, we went below the recommended capacity. We added extra clean, but it costs a lot of money and for some associations, the risk of a lawsuit and the cost to operate the pool or those facilities wasn't bearable. You know, it wasn't that the association could afford to expose the rest of the unit owners that were not willing uh, to go to the pool or didn't want to use those facilities. Um, and I think, you know, for those boards, it was the right decision. We also have learned a couple of things in, in, in this year. What we have learned is that many associations opened their pools and facilities and have it at this point done successfully. So the statute of limitations for claims of COVID has not run. It's negligence is a three year statute of limitations. Um, if a child had gotten uh, COVID at the pool, it's two years after they turned 18. So. You know, we, we have some time to wait and experience. Um, I know that nationwide, I'm, I'm familiar with um, and, and participate in discussions nationwide about COVID lawsuits. And we have, thank goodness, not seen a, an onslaught of COVID-19 cases. So when you see on the 10 o'clock news, which is the only one that I can stay up for, um, and invariably there are at least three or four law firms that advertise for slip and fall cases and premises liability cases. I haven't seen Morgan and Morgan stand up there and said, did you get COVID at the association or did you, you get COVID at the supermarket? Call me and I'll get you lots of money. That hasn't happened yet. And I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't. And I'm hoping that 
uh, the courts will not have tolerance for these cases and that they go away. And, but all of those things together make up the evaluation as to whether or not a board can reopen. And I think for some boards and for some associations, it makes sense. Large, large associations that have lots of kids um, that were shut down and, and camps were closed, um, that, are, that are able to spread the risk and had the money to operate, it, it made sense for them and they went into it eyes wide open and, and the boards took the risk. Smaller association where um, use of the pool may not be as prevalent, um, maybe the right decision was for them to close. And depending on what happens now um, with the vaccine and what happens with the, the effect of the vaccine on infection rates, on death rates, and on sort of the, uh, the CDC guidelines as they continue to change, it may be possible. Uh, and it may also be um, within the applicable standard of care for the association to decide, you know, we, we may be able to open this outdoor facility, the pool, um, and not every facility is going to be the same. So, you know, I think it's easier to open the tennis court and the pickleball court and the bocce ball. Um, the pool is probably the second one. The Bucks County Department of Health gave us a waiver um, when we opened pools for the bathrooms. So if, if, the, uh, if the pool was close enough to the center of the community where unit owners could go home to go to the bathroom, then the Department of Health said you could still open your pool and you could close your bathroom. Because as soon as you get indoors, um, you start to increase the risk, I think. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm no medical expert, but I think the CD, CDC guidelines and, and the state of technology and the medical expertise at this point is, is more focused on, um, on the air and on, on breathing and on masks than they are focused on touch points like uh, you know, elevator buttons or uh, or doorknobs. I haven't, you know, really heard much about doorknobs or elevator buttons or public places. Of course, everybody should wash their hands, but I think the main focus has been on these air spaces. So interior bathrooms, interior card rooms. Um, of course, the gym, I think, is, is the last place that I would open at this point, uh, unless you have a separate HVAC system or, uh, you know, some some real mitigation uh, capabilities. So I, I hope that I didn't bore you to death with that, that the answer to that question. I think ultimately the answer is it is not necessarily negligent to open the facility if you do it within the guidelines and knowing what the risk is and able to spread that risk. You will not have insurance for these claims. Um, it could cost you hundred grand to defend one of these claims, win or lose. If you're a 50, a 50 unit association, that analysis is a whole lot more important than if you have 12 or 1500 units. Thank you. All right. And as I said, uh, we will be doing another session uh, on March 25th on that with Stefan as, as well. I'm going to switch back to, uh, to the presentation. We got a question that says, what is an example of acting or not acting in good faith? In a place I lived previously, the issue came up of treating people fairly. Are we allowed to waive fines for a particular person? What if the person owes for damages for a common area? Can the board decide they will absorb a portion of the cost and not charge the owner? So that's a great question because you know, boards want to be mindful of, of the circumstances of a particular unit. Um, so I certainly encourage a, a, a sort of a standard protocol when dealing with delinquencies and waivers so that um, certain individuals aren't treated better than others. So if you're willing to waive late charges uh, or, or fines, for one person, you really should have the same standard apply to everyone uh, that, that comes to you, that negotiates or tries to negotiate with you. So um, what you don't want to be, I think good faith requires that you don't make arbitrary decisions um, or that you discriminate um, or, or treat people with, with personal favoritism because they are your friends or family or otherwise. So you want to have a, a separation and a standard. 
So, you know, delinquency are particularly difficult because you may have uh, a person that has never been delinquent and ran into trouble and, and you want to deal with him or her uh, on, on a, you know, gentle basis. Who knows, they were sick, they lost their job or both of those things. And I think you can, you can apply sort of your, your standard, but still give some individual attention. Uh, so somebody that's never been delinquent, that you want to put them back on track and, and waive three or four or five late charges, I don't see any problems with that whatsoever. Um, I, if, how do I put this? I know that there are delinquents and in, in, in associations that have been on the delinquency list probably longer than you have been a board member. Um, and, and the question is, do we give them or that person the same leniency? And I don't think you have to. I think you've got to treat each category of delinquents or homeowners or, or, uh, or violators in the same kind of way. Um, is this a mistake? Do they have circumstances? Um, are they... Uh, uh, you know, contrite, or are they just a pain and you want to get rid of them? I think you, you just need to kind of, uh, you know, apply um, your, you almost got to say, you know, let your conscience be your guide on this and, and, and figure out, has the violation been corrected? If, if it's been corrected and it's an isolated incident, I always recommend that you waive the fine and, and, and not try to get 50 bucks out of somebody and make them an enemy forever. Um, you know, if it hasn't been corrected and they continue to get late charges because of the fines and they continue to violate, that's a different circumstance. Uh, ultimately, you want to do two things. You want to bring the account current. You don't want to lose any money on it. So attorney's fees and costs are generally not waived. Um, so that's what the regard to the delinquent homeowner. And with the homeowner that has fines and violations, you also want to bring them into compliance. So what's the best way to accomplish that without losing money or without making an enemy of that person forever? Because they're going to be here for a while. So I, I think you have some discretion uh, for individual attention uh, and for considering certain circumstances and to, again, evaluate it in what's the goal. The goal is um, to get them to come into compliance. If, if that takes, okay, I'll waive your fine if you bring the... Uh, cure the violation, whatever it is, remove the gazebo, um, you know, take down the Christmas lights that, that are still up in, in June. Um, and, uh, and, and if, it, if they don't come back, I won't give you another fine. So I hope that was instructive. I, I feel like I was a little bit all over the place on that answer, but. Uh, it's a big, you know, not a specific. So <laughs> you gave a lot well, of examples, yeah. Um, we had another question uh, that said, Stefan, you haven't said much about the importance of a document trail to support board decisions or to document advice received from experts. Often expert advice is verbal and not always written down. Should it be written down if it is important input to a board's decision? That's absolutely a great question. And in addition to uh, having probably to do another seminar on how much to put an email. Um, you could do another seminar on what should be in minutes of meetings and what you need to memorialize. Certainly, um, if you get legal advice, you want it to be in writing. You don't want it to be uh, over the phone um, or um, you know, via text or something like that. Uh, it protects both me as an attorney, I do not generally give legal advice over the phone without following it up. So I wanna make sure that the legal advice I get um, or I give uh, is translated correctly. And you know, three people will hear, hear things in a different way. Um, and I don't, I don't wanna later have a phone call and say, well, when, when we talked about this, don't you remember, Stefan? You told me A and now you're, you're telling me A is wrong and I'm getting sued get it in writing. And if I'm wrong, then, you know, you can, you can, you know, certainly blame me for making the wrong decision or giving the wrong advice, but that's your insurance policy. Your insurance policy is, I requested advice from the expert. I got it in writing and here it is. 
I think the same applies to accountants. Um, and it really depends on the decision making. Uh, you know, is it is it a, a million dollar project you're trying to uh, um, you're trying to undertake? Are you seeking the advice of an engineer or, or, or a transition study? You know, certainly if the if the opinion is is something that you're concerned with, or the action is something that you're concerned with, and has some consequences, whether they be financial or legal, I always encourage that you get something in writing. Even if it's an email, you know, you know, I don't, I don't just give you know long-winded opinion letters of ten pages. I might give a three or four paragraph email response to something, and and that's often sufficient. It's got my name on it, uh, and you can blame me if I'm wrong. And, but you can say, hey, Stephen, here's the email that you sent. This is the advice that we relied on, and it protects you. It shouldn't cost a lot more money for me uh, to have a phone call. Uh, and to put that phone call into, uh, you know, a memorializing. Email. So, you know, I, I certainly suggest that you get it in writing. And if if you if you seek the advice of an expert, and you can put it in the minutes that says we, we you know we consulted with the engineer. You don't have to put in your minutes what the engineer said, but you have to have a record of what it was. A kitchen engineering report, an attorney opinion letter. Uh, you know, an accountant's opinion letter about, you know, reserve contributions for, you know, a, uh, a transfer between funds, any of those things, you know, it doesn't need to be very formal and on, on, on fancy letterhead with, with embossed signatures, but something in writing that, that you can uh, at least discern was from the person who gave the advice upon which you are relying. So I think that's a great question. And, you know, business records must be kept. And uh, you know, that's what you buy your insurance policy for. You're, you're looking for advice from those people that, that, that should know better than you on a particular subject matter. Great, thank you. Um, all right, since we have about four minutes left, I'm gonna try to combine two questions. <laughs> so if you're bidding a job and an owner lives in the building, is it okay to have them bid on the job? Um, example, if they're an electrician or an interior designer and you want them to help with a project. And then the second part that I will combine is, are we more liable when we rely on the expertise of a board member who is an attorney, account, accountant, engineer, than if we go to outside experts? All right, so the first question, I generally recommend against using um, either board members or individual unit owners as as vendors for associations. Now, if 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 that person has a company or some type of entity that would otherwise, apart from being a unit owner, be eligible to bid on a particular project, then I think it's okay as long as that relationship is disclosed not only to the board, um, but all the way through in the bidding process. You, you don't want to be accused of um, you know, friendship with that board member and kickbacks, whether they are, you know, those are the kind of things, um, especially when it goes bad, that you will be accused of. I know you were friends with, with Charlie and I, yeah, he owns a big company, but if you weren't friends with him, he would have never gotten this contract. But, you know, if they meet all the bidding criteria and, you know, uh, a, a solo electrician will probably not have workers comp will probably not have the kind of liability insurance that you as an association would want. You really need to be careful and make sure that that person has all of the independent credentials, uh, especially when he lives within, within the association. Um, the second question was about relying on board members uh, and their own expertise. I think it depends on, you know, uh, uh, on the board member and the expertise. We talked earlier about um, as a as a member of the board, you cannot leave your own expertise and your own knowledge at the door or stick your head in the sand on something. Um, I represent a lot of associations with a lot of attorney board members, and generally, none of those attorney board members will want to render an opinion on behalf of the association and subject themselves to additional liability. They're not getting paid. Um, so. 
depends on how simple or complicated the, 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 the task is. I always recommend seeking independent advice on, on any important issue because, you know, as I said, it's a little bit of an insurance policy. We, we relied on the advice of experts. We paid for the advice of experts. That person has a liability policy. If things get screwed up, we can sue that person um, and we have some recourse or they have insurance um, to cover damages. If, if you're relying merely on, uh, on a board member's uh, advice, they're gonna be covered by the DNO policy, um, but they could subject themselves to personal liability, um, you know, whether they work for a law firm or giving, uh, you know, CPA advice. Um, I think you, you should probably keep those head hats separate if you can, and if the issue is of any consequence. You know, I mean, obviously, um, if it's a simple matter um, that, that is on, on top of the association board member attorney's head or uh, accountant's head and it's, you know, it's right on off top of the bed, at the top of the head, then I think it's okay. But if you need a formal opinion, you should go outside. Great. Well, I'm sorry so, we I, couldn't I don't get have a hard stop at I, I can answer another question unless you want to end. It's okay with me. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, so, okay. Well, this is an interesting one. Can Stefan share a few examples of when a board was successfully sued and the mistakes that were made that exposed the board to liability? So we get breach of fiduciary uh, cases all the time. Um, and most of the time what happens is the DNO coverage will step in and defend that board member or that association. I have not seen, except in cases where a board member stole money, uh, personal liability on a board member. That doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it's very rare uh, because the burden of proving either willful misconduct or self-dealing or gross negligence is pretty high. Uh, and then while association uh, board member decisions have sometimes been overturned because there's a conflict of interest, it wasn't proper disclosure, they didn't rely on experts, um, they didn't do their due diligence, or they ignored the declaration or bylaws, you know, sometimes a decision of the board will fall. That does not necessarily mean, though, that a board member is individual li liable for, um, for that decision. So it, it's pretty rare, I would say, for a board member to walk away and having to pay an attorney individually, um, not, only, not only for defense, um, but for indemnification or any damages like that. I'm not going to tell you that you're totally immune from lawsuit or, or damages, but I will tell you that it's pretty rare. Okay. Um, regarding conflicts of interest, uh, in the case of a realtor that sits on the board um, and wants to continue to sell real estate within the association, what safeguards can be put in place to avoid conflicts? There are concerns of unwanted solicitations in the event of dues lapses indicating a possible foreclosure. Also the use of the agent of a third party partner approaching the resident. Overall, the use of inside information. Yeah, I certainly think that that's a bad idea and the, uh, to, to have somebody serve on the board that it could have a pecuniary interest in the association as a whole and certainly uh, um, gain personally from confidential information about unit owners and, and their personal finances and collection action. So, you know, I would certainly caution against it. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and, and, and those individuals will be in your association. All you can really do is when decisions are made is you could, um, you could register your dissent on a particular matter where you think that that unit owner is not acting in the best interest of the association, but as acting in his or her best interest. Um, you you want to bring it to the attention of the entire board if the circumstances get to, get to be uh, a bit hairy, um, or bring it to the attention of the association's attorney and say, can we get an opinion as to the impact of, of this board member's uh, professional life uh, on, on the association? And it's, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's more common than you think, uh, but, you know, I think it's a real problem when 
uh, when confidential information is used for 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 personal gain it's 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 a breach of fiduciary obligation you're not acting in the best interest of the association you may think you are because you're buying and selling real estate and keeping property values up but the the, the way you're doing it is you're partially getting information that you shouldn't be privy to uh, otherwise. So about delinquencies or foreclosures or other things. So unless something is public record, um, and if you have a concern about it as the other board member, uh, I would suggest that you ask the remaining board members uh, for a legal opinion or some independent advice as to how to go forward in that circumstance. All right, one more question that's pretty relevant. So, uh, you know, now that the board's doing 99% of board functions via email, um, can you sort of elaborate on your thoughts on, uh, you know, voting and, and discussions via email with the board? Right. Amongst so, people, say. <clears throat> you, you may not know, but um, unless your email is to and from the attorney of the association uh, uh, about a particular legal matter or is somehow protected by the attorney client privilege, it is totally and absolutely discoverable. So anything you put in that email, I don't like this guy. I think he's a deadbeat. He's a drunk. He's been, uh, he's been a bad unit owner forever. I wish he would move. All of those things are going to be put in uh, in writing, and emails don't die. So you need to use your email carefully, not as dialogue, uh, but as a decision-making tool. And unless you're doing something via Zoom, where you're all sort of in the same room, at least virtually, and, and can hear and participate, email communications or email decisions should be unanimous um, in order to hold, it isn't uh, it isn't the same as a as a board meeting where you only need a quorum of the decision. If it's only in the email, you need unanimous consent. Unanimous consent is required when something is done in writing only. So if you do it in conjunction with a with a Zoom meeting, or you go to the next meeting and you ratify all of those decisions, I'd be really careful about relying on emails because there's no there's no minutes of meetings. You have okay, well I'm going to print these five emails. That say, yeah, I agree that uh, we should you know, file suit against this unit owner or something like that. Really tough to keep a record. And, uh, you know, I have 22,000 emails in my inbox, and it's really hard for me to delete them. If, if I print any one of them out, they could be 40 pages of emails back and forth about totally irrelevant stuff like, um, I'll, I'll, Let's have the meeting at four. Now I can't make it at four. Let's do it at five thirty. And then intermingled in that is, um, you know, here's my opinion on 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 the following matter. And it gets to be really squirrely. Um, so I don't keep your email separate from your association your association email account separate from your personal account. Only do association business and try to keep uh, try to keep it as if you know that that email and anything that you type may eventually appear in a court of law. So that's the only thing I can caution you about. Um, tough to say don't use email because I know you will and I know everybody does and we do it too. We're not perfect at it. Um, but if you're asking me, is email communications discoverable? Absolutely, it's discoverable. It doesn't die, it won't go away and it could definitely hurt you. Uh, I've been in depositions where you know, these emails and they're like this thick when you print them out. Let's go to page 47 of this email from so and so. Didn't you say that, you know, this person was a drunk? Um, it, it's just, it's just bad. So, you know, you don't need to change everything that you're doing. Be careful about what you write. You know, it's only protected if you copy your attorney and if it has to do with a particular legal matter, then it may be covered by the attorney client privilege. That doesn't mean you can copy your, your attorney on every single email and cover it by the privilege. Um, but, uh, you know, at least you have an argument. Don't do that because I can't take, I can't take all those emails about uh, appointments and times and meetings. <laughs> People have tried. But these all right. are all great questions. So, uh, you know, I certainly feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody seems to be, you know, asking all the right questions. So 
I have no doubt in my mind that you understand what the standard of care is and, and that you really do understand your role as board members. And I, I wish it's the other board members that would attend these kind of meetings um, that would listen to this kind of advice um, because it's, it's really important functions that, that you, you undertake. You're in, you're in charge of millions of dollars worth of assets, uh, accounts, uh, people's lives, and you know you get how important that is. Not everybody does, so I, I really do appreciate the opportunity when I when I can speak to you and not only tell you that you're doing a great job, um, but you know I, I got to thank you for um, for really paying attention. You make my job a lot easier when you attend these things and you understand what's required and when to ask the question because. You know, you don't know how many times I've seen a board that self-managed that says, you know, we signed this contract, but what do you think? Okay, well, I can tell you what I think, but it's not really relevant. What you should have done is ask me beforehand. You all know that they ask, ask me or your accountant or your manager beforehand. So you're, you seem to be in pretty good shape. And again, I, I appreciate your time.